Hey everybody, my name is Al Nicoletti. I'm an attorney here in Florida and welcome to the Al Nicoletti Show where I bring on real estate super investors, rising rock stars, movers and shakers, and leaders of clubs in the community that educate, entertain, and inspire all things Florida real estate on how you can take your company to the next level. Well, as you know, the Al Nicoletti Show is live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. You can check it out on the business page. It's also streaming on Twitch. We'll eventually figure out the YouTube channel. We'll get there. Uh, but make sure you check it out on all those social media apps. And on today's show, I have a special guest, Trevor Augustus, super investor, super dad that's been buying homes in Jacksonville for over 20 years. And I'm so happy to have him on the show today. He's He has a great story from troubled youth to wild man to crazy stories before real estate. He's really jumped in the whole real estate game and he's been buying, selling houses. He's a single dad that's been doing this on his own with no staff. And we're going to talk about that today on the show. But with Trevor, you can learn so much about his skills, all the things that he knows when it comes to real estate. I don't do anything with the investing world, and I can learn from those sales pitches, the sales skills, the Trevor charm that he'll uh, put on today probably for everybody. But you can learn so much from his methods and everything that he does. But Trevor's focused on self-education, self-motivation, and, and why acquisitions are king and why sales skills sell. And it's so important to have that in your business and why it matters for real estate. Because on the show, I'm going to be talking with Trevor about how to stay small and keep it all. That's something I'd like to know about. And, and that's the hook point that he wanted to have, how to stay small and keep it all. We'll talk about that and why acquisitions are king and why knowing sales is everything in your real estate business and how to keep growing if you're the creative type. Many of us out there are creative in what we do. We're all different. Not everybody's the same. But if you're creative, how do you do it? And Trevor's going to talk about that and why partnerships are a great way to fill in the gaps. Everybody's different. So everybody's got a different role in their business and Trevor has a role in what he does. And of course, partnerships can work if you have the right people and you find the right rhythm. So he'll talk about that. And of course, what's the Alan Nicoletti show without talking about probate? So what's dead is alive and why the Florida probate niche is the hot market. Trevor wants to tell you all about that. He loves the probate niche. And so of course, we're going to talk about that. But of course, how a single dad with two toddlers does two to four deals per month and with no staff, how he's super dad, super investor. So without further ado, and we're going to talk about the Alan Nicoletti signature questions at the end because we have to point out those to Trevor. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Trevor Augustus. Trevor, thanks so much for being here, man. I, I know we planned this for so long and I was ready to have you. I wanted you on live. You know, we've, we've talked about probate so many times in the last two years, but Trevor, so happy to have you on the show. Welcome to the Al Nicoletti show. Awesome, Al. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Glad the uh, day is here. I know it's finally arrived. And I wanted to share with everybody, like how we even connected, you know, the first time we connected in person was at a Yellowbird meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that happened like in 2019, like middle of 2019. But the first time actually, I think was by like an email about some pre foreclosure that was happening. And that was like the first time you and I connected. Then really? we see each other. Yeah, I, I, that's how I remember it. Then oh, we cool. see each other at the Yellowbird event. And yep. you're just like, wait, you know, tell me more about probate. And yeah. then I explained everything. And you're like, this is the niche. This is what we're going for. I'll see you later. So it all took off from there. And then probate deal after probate deal, you've been killing it. You've been crushing it in the real estate market. I've seen you uh, doing seminars and events with people. So Trevor, tell everybody who's Trevor, what were you doing before you got into real estate? Uh, you know, what was, what was the wild man times, the crazy times, and what was that motivation to get you into the real estate world that you are today where you're flipping homes, you're doing, you're doing with no staff, you have kids, Tell us all about that. How did you get here? Awesome. Yeah, so I really, I remember meeting you, um, obviously, at, at the very first time that was. So I met you before you were famous, before you had your Al Nicoletti show. And um, I actually like to do that. I kind of have a niche for like just meeting random people and um, just having like a good eye for like people that I'll get along with and people I'll work with. And um, I've met people in the past that 
had no idea who they were. I was just the first person to say hello to them. And then found out later they became the president of Warner Brothers and crazy stuff like that. So um, I just like to meet people and um, I could I have an eye for talent. So I knew you had uh, some bright things in your future. So uh, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm, it's taken off, right? So yeah, yeah. You know, we all start somewhere, but you know we we have to know. So how did you get from the wild man era to yeah. the real estate super investor, super yeah. dad era? Yeah. So I'll um, try to paint that picture real quick. Um, you know, I grew up a uh, little disjointed, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, single mom household, didn't know my dad, um, back and forth um, in some halfway houses, some, you know, some some issues as a kid, getting in trouble, things like that. Um, had some challenges. Um, I mean, to the point where like I was an angry kid, I punched through a window and almost died. I was in a coma cause I, I bled out on my, um, my arteries and my arm when I was like 12 years old. And so, um, you know, it was just, just learning you know, how to deal with life. And, um, I think it was around uh, 18 years old. I finally kind of moved back in with my mom after all kinds of stints doing stuff uh, my way. Moved back in with my mom, decided to get back on track, got a regular job at the mall, um, started advancing quickly. I became the assistant manager at a store in the mall when I was like 18. They gave me the keys and I was kind of, my uh, stepdad at the time was kind of like bragging about me to one of his friends and his friend asked to meet me and it turned out he worked um they were hiring people to be salespeople, like telemarketers and i had no idea um what they sold what the business was about but i heard the guy was a millionaire and it had something to do with real estate and so i was like cool and so i went to the interview um, I ended up taking the job. It was like seven bucks an hour, reading a script, selling a real estate course. It ended up being for uh, Ron Legrand's um, uh, $50 introduction course. He would, he would sell it late night on the infomercial. And so I would call people back and, and sell them the course and had no idea at all what it was or what I was doing. I was just reading the script. If they had an objection, I read the objections and, um, you know, sold some people this $50 course. Well, I started seeing like testimonials and letters and this one lady sent in like a fruit basket and said, thank you. Um, she made $70,000 on a deal um, from this course, you know, that I had sold her. And so she said, thank you for that. And I was just like, what in the heck are we even selling here? So uh, my little radar went off and I started kind of angling my way to learn more. Um, and I started asking if I could go to the seminars and if I could help out. Um, I said, I'd work for free. If you just let me go, I'll stack the chairs. I'll do the registration. I'll run the mics. I'll do anything I can. Um, it's like 18, 19 at this time. And so, um, I went to a seminar, my very first kind of real estate seminar when I was 18, 19 years old. And, um, I didn't know what they were talking about. It was like a five day boot camp, real advanced stuff, creative financing, um, deeds into trust, um, just stuff that was above my head. But I did pick up one thing. And the one commonality that everyone there kept saying, and this was like 1999, so a little old school, but the one thing everybody was saying when they would tell their story is, you know, I put out the signs and then I took the calls and then you know, they would have these deal, these details about the deal after that. And so my 18, 19 year old brain was just like, okay, I don't know what they're talking about, but I got to get these signs. That's all I knew. And so, um, I just bought like a hundred signs for like 300 bucks, went home, started putting them out the normal, we buy houses signs, and then just got the course and started trying to figure out who needed help. Um, I found this one seller who, had just gotten married. They couldn't sell their other house. They moved in together and um, they were interested in learning uh, more how I could solve their problem. Just basically they couldn't afford two house payments. They were two payments behind 
And so I went to their house. I'll never forget. It was like 8 p.m. at night, uh, maybe 8.30. It was dark. I showed up at their house and I literally brought the course book with me to the house in case they had any questions because I didn't know the answers. And so I walked in um, to their house. Their little kids are like playing. They're like climbing on my head um, and they're asking me questions. And I'm literally turning the book and answering the questions. They're like, and we're talking about me taking over their house payments because they were facing foreclosure. Um, right. And they're like, how do we know you're going to make our payments? And I would literally turn to that page. And I don't know if you know Ron's teaching, but he's pretty blunt. And it'd be like, you don't, but who's making your payment now? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a good point, right? So nobody's and they looked at me, That's exactly what they said. They were like, well, that's a good point. And so um, long story short, I got my first property um, under contract, took over the payments, 18, 19 years old. And uh, that's what kind of kicked all this off for me. Wow. So first, first deal ever done, sub two. Yep. Wow. And so, yeah, I read that in your bio uh, before the show. I read that your first job was getting that sales, that phone call uh, center uh, thing with Ron Legrand, which is very interesting. It's like the first thing you did, you're working for the the godfather of real estate investing. And yep. from there you see everybody making the money and then you're just like, well, wait a second, what am I doing? Like, I need to, I need to get in this game. And you jumped in and, and look at that. Like first thing you did is sub two. And I, I could totally see that you're the type to do that, right? Like you're holding the book and like, hold on there. There's <laughs> the answer. So um, that, but they that, thought it would, they thought it was an operations manual. They thought it was a company manual. And so like, if anybody's new and they're listening and you're like worried and you have these things, the reason I tell that story is because, you know, we overthink like, what if I don't know the answer? What if, and we're just thinking about ourselves too much. You know, I went in, these people have a problem. They're two payments behind. I know other people can figure out how to do this. I know I can figure out how to do this. And if I can, I've got this book and we can figure it out together. Uh, luckily, they were cool enough to kind of go with that. And that really goes to being a salesman, right? So like you, you had it in your mind about like, I really want this deal. I really want the sale on this. Like, what am I going to put myself in? Like, how do I put myself in that position to get that deal? And you, you did it right there. You pitched it, whether they thought it was a manual, you knew what you were doing. So you, you took a lot of the sales skills, were you, like in teenager years, were you doing anything sales wise or anything like that? It was just straight from Ron LeGrand. Cause a lot of guests on the show, they always have a background, like before they do the real estate side. And that's that background somehow comes together on the real estate side. So maybe it was sales, but sales is your thing. And that's why you, sure. yeah. Right. And, and the, one, the one thing I, I want to kind of, um, really make sure we hit is the reason the sale works is because my character is 100%. I am not going to let these people down. My character is 100%. I'm not going to let myself down. My character is 100%. I will figure out how to do this deal. I will make these people's payment for them. They will be better off having met me than if they didn't. And so the sales is good, but it also, you have to have the confidence and you have to have, I think really the character is the right word is, is, to not, to not back off if it gets hard. Like that deal was really hard to sell. Like, frankly, it was in the hood in Jacksonville. It was uh, McDuff and Commonwealth and I couldn't sell it either, but I was 18, 19 years old. And so I moved in it. I'm like, well, if I'm making the payment, I'm going to live here. So I got a no down, nothing down house, you know, at, at 18, 19 years old. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's sales. Yes, but it's also, um, making sure that you don't let people down, don't let yourself down and you follow through. You can't just have sales skills only and not follow through with the service side. So I just want to hit that. But yeah, I mean, I was no, definitely hustling great. as a kid. Yeah, I was definitely, um, I remember the first thing was third grade. I used to buy um, $5 packs of Warheads was the name of the candy. They were so sour on the outside but then you got to the inside and they were super sweet. Um, I could buy a pack at pick and save was the name of the, the, the grocery store for five bucks, maybe three bucks. And I would sell them for a quarter each. There was like a hundred in there. Um, 
So I don't know what I made, like 20, 30 bucks off that in like third grade. It was cool. Natural salesman back then. See, that's that's what I'm saying. It's like that that background kind of brings you to the forefront of where you are today. That's why you're good at your sales and good at your leads. But like going back to what you just said about that's a mindset thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't want to let people down. You don't want to, you're, you're, you're there for them. Yep. You go into every single deal like that, right? Like every kind of meeting with the seller, you're going in with that mindset in your mind. Are you thinking about like a checklist in your head about overcoming seller objections? Not something we were talking about or going to talk about, but like thinking about the objections that come along the way where they're saying no, 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 or, you know, how are you overcoming those moments yeah, in, in, in a sales moment, right? So you have to be a real salesman at that time. I think I'm naturally like, it's a gift and a curse, but I'm naturally like a people pleaser in a way. So, you know, the only thing you need to do as an investor to, to kind of buoy that people pleaser mentality is I'm a people pleaser at the right price. So I want to do everything possible to make this a great deal for you. I only want it to be perfect for you. If you want to move in a week, then I want to close in a week. If you want to move in five months, I want to, I want to close in five months. I want to do anything that, that works for you at the right price. So I'm a people pleaser to the fullest, but I, I, you just have to have that discipline to not overpay because that's the one thing a people pleaser can do is sometimes eh, I could pay them a little more just to make them happy or just to get the deal. So there's a, a balance of, of really giving them everything they want, um, but really being disciplined and knowing your numbers. Interesting. Not giving in on the money, but you can be flexible on the auxiliary things when it comes to moving out and what their details are on that end. That's a, that's a great tip right there, right? Exactly. You know, being flexible with what they want. So how, let me ask you this. You, you're, you're a single dad, solo dad, you're a super dad, right? So you're doing these things on your own and you're able to keep it on a small scale for yourself, right? So how are you keeping your business the way it is on one level and mm -hmm. then doing it all and not overwhelming yourself, right? So many people out there. So when I went out on my own, um, I had a lot of people say, wow, that was crazy that you did that. Like, I've been thinking about doing it. I've been thinking about doing this one, that one. And it's like, you know, you, you just do it because you're surrounded by great people that help you and mm -hmm. you, you know what you want to do. But how did you, how did you do it where you keep it this way? Where you're not mass scaling, not m going mm -hmm. too far, but keeping it all. Yeah. And I, I've tried, you know, to scale a little bit. I mean, perfectly honest. Like it's just not my hundred percent skill is, is scaling and hiring. Um, there's, there's a lot of logistics in there. Um, so I, I've done it, you know, it's gone good, but not great or whatever. And so what I've really kind of honed in on is, is what works for me. So, um, you get good at a couple things. You get good at, at lead generation and you get good at talking to sellers and closing deals. Like the market's good. The house, you know, it sells himself. Um, you don't need to get too caught up in the construction. You don't need to get too caught up in, in the selling. You can have people help you do that stuff. Contractor, realtor. I still have realtors. I realtors sell my houses, even though I'm licensed and I could do it myself, but I, I will outsource and I will contract out. Um, but I think one of the big things for me is I don't need, a, you got to focus on what works for you. So let's, Let's say you're a one man band, certain lead channels aren't going to work for you. So like, um, so like let's, I focus on internet marketing. I do SEO, I do AdWords. Those are my two main ones right now. Right. And I've, I've done a bunch of deals off of Facebook leads. I've done a bunch of deals off of direct mail and stuff like that before, but the difference in, in those channels is they require more leads. You have to talk to 30 people to get one deal, let's say, right? So I've, right. I've found the channels where I can talk to five people and get a deal, 10 people and get a deal. And so when it really comes down to it, I don't need a lot of leads. I don't need a lot of business to keep things flowing. If I can do a deal and you know your numbers, one out of five or 10 leads, let's say, then you only need 20 or 30 leads 
for the month. That's what? That's one lead a day. You're telling me you can't handle one lead a day. I mean, even if my daughter's in the car, like I've got, you've got all these tools set up. A lead comes in on the website. I've got this app. It's called Zapier. It's, it sends me a text and it lets me know I have a new lead. Even if my daughter's in the car, we hit that button. Got to call a seller, baby, trying to buy a house, you know, and be quiet for a few minutes. <laughs> Working on it. But the kids don't mess up the deals. Like that's one thing that, that, that took me a while to figure out. Like a lot of people like overthink it and, and become overstressed, but I've just incorporated it kind of into my life where I'll tell the seller, Oh yeah, that's my daughter in the background. And they'll say, Oh, how old is she? Okay. Yeah. I've got grandkids that age. And it becomes a talking point. It becomes a rapport builder. You know, it makes you real. So, um, I, you know, that's why I don't have a problem with it. You know, you figure out, uh, you, you know, your key performance indicators, your numbers, how many leads do you need? What's your conversion rate? Okay. Can you handle that? And another big thing that I do is I do not go to houses that I don't think I'm going to get the deal. If the house is worth $250,000, it needs a roof, it needs plumbing, it needs floors. The person tells you that on their form. They tell you that on the phone and they're asking 225. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to the house to offer you 150. Like we're just too far. Like it's not going to work. I'll give you a ballpark on the phone. And if, um, if, if you're asking price changes, give me a call back and we'll, I'll come out and I'll give you a real number. Um, but my point is I'm not, I'm not trying to make every single deal work. I, I am that cherry picker at the, at the basketball court. I'm just waiting under the goal for, for the layups. I know you've told me about that before too, that you're looking for that one where you're getting that contract. Like, I think, I think you've called me one time and like, how's it going? You're like, I'm still waiting for the the catch. I'm still waiting for it. And then you're just like, there's another deal, whether you're, you've locked it up under contract. So you yeah. like those where it can, it can really happen. You're not going to waste your time on the ones where you just got to pull and what's happening on title and what's this and that, like you get it's down. Really, and not to cut you off, but the big thing is asking price. Like you don't need to overcomplicate this. If, if you're an investor and you're trying to buy the house at 70, 80% of the value minus the repairs, and they're asking a hundred percent of the ARV, the likelihood of you getting in your car, driving an hour, walking that house, spending four hours out and then coming back and offering that guy 80 grand less than he really wants. Like, yes, you might get 10% of those deals. And if you're scaled up, and you have a salesperson and you have a staff, they have nothing better to do Then yes, you should go to every deal and you can make more money than me. Like, fine. That's great. Like I want people to serve, you know, to get all the deals that, that they deserve. Um, I'm just not, I'm not, my business isn't built for that. So I'm not going to every single deal. It's, it's all about efficiency. It's all about, um, you know, the reward possibility for the opportunity. Um, the one thing I, everyone likes to start <laughs> the, the little analogy. I, I kind of like to think to myself is like a lot of people like to say, Oh, I'm a lion. I'm a beast. But what does a lion do all day? It sleeps. It chills. When a mouse walks by, it will not chase a mouse. There's not enough calories. It's not worth the energy. It waits until it sees a big enough game that's worth chasing and then it goes. So, you know, if you're managing kids, you're managing life, you're running your own business, you know, I would encourage you not to chase every deal. Don't waste your time going to deals and asking price as simple as it sounds is the number one indicator of, of the likelihood of you getting that deal. The further you are apart on what you think you'll pay, and what their asking price is, the least, the less likely you are to actually get that deal. And I know that seems stupid simple, but it's proven true over 20 years now. So for you though, you cast a wide net of these possible deals. For some people, they don't cast a wide net, maybe 20, 30, or hoping, hoping for things to come in. Sometimes this is like their only deal. Sometimes this is their their second deal like ever. So what about to those people that are dealing with that one that's just 
a, a, a time waster, a time consumer? Like, how do you, how do you, what's your best advice to help them move on from that to find the next one that they feel anxious about because they're saying, I don't know if I'm going to ever find another deal. I think this mm -hmm. is going to be the one, but it's never going to happen. What do you do? Like, so if they don't have a lot of leads, yeah, basically, don't have it. And, and the one lead they get, they're just not that motivated. Or, or not motivated, or it's a title issue that's going to take forever, mm -hmm. um, or you can't get all the heirs because it's just a, a wackadoodle probate, uh, something like that. Like yeah. you know, for for those people though, that for you, you know, in your net, in your in your lead system, that yep. there's going to be more coming down the pipe. But for those that um, don't have many deals and they're like stuck on that one deal, what's your best advice for them? Just to keep moving on, go, just no. forget. Nope. I would say the opposite. I'd say make that person your best friend. So they may not be motivated today, but if you don't have a lot of leads, you become that person's best friend and you do not become pressure, but you stay involved. You find out what's going on. Um, they've got some long drawn out title thing. They've got some probate court case where someone's challenging it and, you know, uh, that should become your best friend. If you don't have any leads, you just have one, just talk to them. Like really spend 30 minutes on the phone, talk to them. Don't hammer the deal. Let them talk. How's it going? Yeah. What happened with that situation? Just checking in on you. How you doing? Keep it, keep it really friendly and they will. So if you don't have a lot of leads, you really should um, turn up the empathy and let that be become there to really help that person. Whether they sell the house to you or not, you're gaining experience. You're gaining character. You're gaining trust. You don't know what's going to happen. You cannot be that short-sighted. I mean, sure, some people are sharks. You know, if you're not a great deal, then get out of my face or whatever. But being in this business a long time, you have no idea like the roundabout story, the roundabout way things work. I'll give you a perfect example. I went to a deal one time. This is when I was first getting back um, into things. I took a few years off. So 2016, I kind of came back in full time and I was in an internet marketing group. Um, we kind of had a mastermind. It was a pretty expensive mastermind doing internet marketing. And so um, we become pretty good friends with all the people that were in the group. Well, I went to show up at this one house and one of the ladies that was in our, our mastermind group comes from the house across the street and she's like, Oh my God, Trevor, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And I was like, Oh, I'm looking at this house, you know? And she was crying. She's like, no, this is, I have an, an oral agreement to buy this house. This is my neighbor, you know? Um, I'm going to move in my daughter and my, my special needs grandson. They live in a horrible neighborhood. They need to live here across from me so I can take care of them. And she was like, um, really frazzled that she might lose this deal. And like really reluctantly, um, I wrestled with this quite a bit and I backed off and I, um, I helped her close that deal. I could have easily got that deal. I had more experience. Um, I could have closed the deal. So I backed off. I helped her close the deal. It worked out perfect. She moved in her special needs grandson. It was amazing for their family. Um, I wasn't sure if I made the right decision. And just crazy, about a year later, um, this woman calls me and she's like, hey, I'm a friend of this lady. And she's like, she told me all about you. She's like, I'm a private lender. I'm looking to to put some money with an investor so I can gain, you know, some passive income. Um, and I wanted to give it to her, but she doesn't have any deals. And she said, you were the most trustworthy person that she knows in the whole city. And I would like to give you money. And so she called me out of the blue. She's become a great private lender, um, for the past year or two now, and really helped me take my business to the next level, being able to close every deal. I don't have to wholesale every deal. I don't have to, stress myself out finding the buyers, um, you know, before I can close. And so it's just one of those random things that like you do the right thing and you, you be willing to like every deal doesn't matter if you're in this thing for the long haul, you, you can kind of do the right thing and you just don't know how karma is going to come back for you. So it's just a little example of that. Right. I mean, 
like you said, I mean, you could have taken that deal, but you, you have a good heart. So you, you helped them in that situation. And because of doing that, it was recognized by somebody that saw what you did and look at that, it comes back later. So yeah, if you're in this business, you, yep. and you're in it for the long term. You have to think about what that's going to be uh, later down the road. And you know, you still work together with that private lender to this day. I've got her money right now. Oh wow! There you go. You got the money. So that that's incredible. And she gets she gets a monthly check, and you know it's great for her. Um, and, and I'm not trying to like overly brag about that and say that that's what you should do. Like, there's no wrong answer there. there it wouldn't be wrong to have done the deal. Um, it's just a little illustration that kind of popped in my head that like you don't know what's going to come back around. So if you are in this for the long haul, then a deal's a deal. Like do the ones that come to you, the ones that aren't perfect for you, let them go and, and keep going. Keep going. Well, I tell you this, if you're, if you're going to be in that business, then you got to do the right thing at the right time. And it helps everybody trying to help the community grow. Right. We're all, we're all about community. It was not a question that I had here, but, uh, how has this community really helped uh, grow your real estate business, Trevor? Like being in Jacksonville, you've been here, what, 20 years, right? So um, you've seen it grow. You've seen the the different investors, the different companies. What's that been like for you? And, and, and what does it mean to you with the real estate community? I think the community is awesome. Um, there's some amazing people with uh, great teams doing a lot of deals and very helpful. Um, I mean – you know, all the, the bigger guys in the city have all helped me out. Um, Kyle from Yellow Birds helped me out a ton. I've partnered with him on a bunch of deals. Um, OB at Freedom, REI, uh, we partnered on a bunch of deals. We've got one going now. Awesome. Uh, uh, JWB, they've helped a ton, bought and sold houses with them before. So um, I think it's awesome. I think it's great, you know. Um, and working- I don't really... Well, it's amazing, right? You you build yeah. partnerships, right? That was something that we were going to talk about too. Is that you 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 have this whole community, you work with all these people, and you build great partnerships together, right? Well, you can only do so much. Like as an investor, you're going to have bandwidth um, issues, so you've got so much cash that you can close a deal, or you've got so much ability to raise private money, or even if you can raise unlimited private money, you know, usually you need to put down some of your own money, cover some of the repairs and even 10% or covering the repairs. That's 30, 40, 50 grand out of pocket. You can only do that so many deals. And so, you know, being able to partner with other investors who have more resources than you or have buyers lists or can fill in the gaps for whatever you need. Maybe they can manage the construction or they've got the money like a thousand percent. Like that's what you should do. So for you and your business, how have you felt partnerships have filled in your gaps, right? So my, one of my strong suits, what's marketing being out yeah. there, you know, I got the sales, right? So yeah. um, I'll, I'll leave the admin to the team, the accounting team and all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. Not where, not where the talents are, right? So sure. having a partnership means that you're filling in the gaps of being able to do your strong suits. Yep. And then, and also delegating the things you don't want to do or yep. don't know how to do, don't have the time to do. So in your business, where mm-hmm. have you felt those gaps have been really critical to help you scale or, or keep it small and keep it all, but keep it consistent in everything so you're not falling behind? Yeah. So, I mean, you have to bring something to the table. So the, the first thing that I bring to the table is I'll bring... I'll bring the lead and the opportunity to the table. So, you know, with the background in internet marketing, uh, background in sales, you know, I can handle the initial acquisition piece. Um, and then where it makes sense to bring on partners is, okay, you close and fund it and get it sold or you fix it up and sell it. And I'll focus on going to get a new deal. Um, so that's where it makes sense for me to kind of partner with people because I can stay in my zone where I do what I do best. Now, we were going to talk about growing and it, it makes sense to to challenge that paradigm. You don't want to stay stuck only doing that one piece and constantly giving out 50% of the deal or more or less or whatever it is. 
there comes a time where maybe you have less leads or you have, um, you need a deal, you need money, whatever. And you want to challenge yourself. Okay. This one, I'm going to raise the money myself. This one, I'm going to manage the construction myself. This one, I'm going to see it through and sell it to a retail buyer. And I know I'm going to wait four to five months, you know, to get my money back. And that's how you grow. And that's how you um, put yourself in position to go find new private lenders, to go bring in people, you know, that, that can help you in your business and, 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 and challenge yourself. I mean, so that's, that's where it comes. Like finding your comfort zone is great and doing what you're good at and letting other people do what they do. That's cool. But you know, it's got its downside. It can get a little boring, a little rat on a wheel. So you do want to be challenging and, and trying new things. Like I just, I just took on a huge rehab. Um, that was, you know, the biggest one I've ever done, you know, on my own all the way through. And so, you know, it was just, just fun to, to push, push it out there and, and challenge myself that way. And that's you growing, being the creative type, right? Like, like first time, like really doing that. Yeah. So, I mean, it can, it can get monotonous when you're just wholesaling or you're just doing the acquisitions, you know, it's like, okay, you can get, you can make a lot of money, but you can also get in a rut that way. Right. And so this one was like, wow, this is a cool house. It's this big three story house on the water. You know, it needs a rehab, you know, I'm going to put myself in position to be a little more creative on this one. I'm going to go to the house a lot. Um, it had a metal roof. I'm like, let's paint the metal roof orange. So we painted the freaking roof orange. It ended up looking awesome. But it's like just putting yourself in these new positions um, to try new pieces of the business. But I will, I will emphasize, only do that when you're ready. Stick with what you're good at. Build up enough cash flow to where you're not going to put your family at risk and your your personal finances at risk, um, taking on these big projects. So I'm, I'm real big about like, so in the business I'll take risk, you know, cause we are, we're buying houses, you know, being stuck with inventory, taking on huge private loans, you know, it's a lot to manage and balancing that with being really conservative on my personal finances. So like on my personal side, you know, I don't, I don't borrow money do the emergency fund. I invest in, you know, index funds and just do kind of like the Dave Ramsey, super conservative, safe play. And then over here on the real estate side, that's where I'm willing to take some risks because I've built up the foundation where if one deal goes bad, it's not going to bankrupt me or, you know, send the house into foreclosure. Right. So how you keep growing if you're the creative type is, Number one, you got to be ready. And number two, you then get out of your comfort zone to then take on new things that you weren't taking on before to see if that's your style, right? To see if that's your angle on what you like and what you do. That's how you, you just keep growing. You just take on the challenge. You, you get out of that comfort zone and that's what changes and molds your mind to go on to the next level. That's yeah, and, you can, and you can find all a bunch of little places to do it. So like as stupid as it is, or as simple as it is, but like Google my business, for example, it's got little thing on there to just do these little posts. You know, Google's trying to be like Facebook. They're trying to be more social now. So they want business owners to make posts about their business. So, you know, once a week they send a little reminder and I just sit right there and I'll write my own blog. I'll write my own story about a deal that just closed or, and I'll post it on Google or I'll write my own blog on the website or I'll go study a new creative, you know, that might work on Facebook ads. So, you know, they say you don't want to be a jack of all trades, but in reality, you should know a little bit about every uh, piece that surrounds your business and you should be able to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to get like, you know, uh, like a intern or someone to write your posts for you. And that's cool. Like it gets the job done, but if you're creative, you should, you should, take that time to really write your own stuff and really, really find places where, where you can be creative. Otherwise you're stuck in a, a business, which is real estate, which is, you know, construction is mechanical finances, 
is numbers. None of that stuff's really creative. So if you want to add the creative side to it, you really should um, be writing your own blogs. You should be um, picking out your own stuff when it comes to the rehabs, picking out your colors, like just adding that variety um, to keep things fresh for yourself. Interesting. So you're big into marketing. You 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 like all that stuff. You like the, the either the social media, the ads, or direct mail, and whatever you do on that end. What do you find has been really effective to uh, your marketing strategy to getting your message out there, your uh, to your direct to sellers? Like, because there's so many different types, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like that that's what you like. You like the Google ads, or you like the social media. What do you find that's been effective, especially now? Mm -hmm. uh, in 2021 and maybe even last year, maybe you saw a shift. What do you find effective? Um, I like showing up for people that are searching. So, you know, I've done everything and I, um, it all works. So like everything works, direct mail works, Facebook works, SEO works, AdWords works. It all works. It's just finding what really works for you. So we'll go back to the efficiency side and like, how do you manage it yourself? I like finding sellers. I like sellers coming to me when it was their idea. So if they type into Google, who's the best house buyer in Jacksonville or we buy houses or sell my house fast, you know, that's their idea. I know it's a, it's a real subtle shift. Even, even Facebook ads, you're putting a billboard in front of their face and sure they click on it, but it, the idea didn't come from their own heart in enough way that, made them search out the term. So just the difference in motivation, if, if you pay attention to that, it's their idea versus your idea. Direct mail was your idea. You're trying to get them to call you. Facebook was your idea. You put up the ad and you're trying to get them to call you. Whereas a search engine, whether it's Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever it is, this is their idea. And so a lot of people don't understand like that psychological difference is a huge difference in motivation. And so you're already starting off with a motivated person who knows what they're looking for. They know what kind of buyer you are and they're okay with that. And so, and then Google puts you up top, whether it's with an ad or an SEO or my maps rankings really good. Cause I have a lot of Google reviews. Um, that's another big tip is get a lot of reviews. And so if they can do their own social proof, read through the reviews, they're heartfelt, they're good, they kind of speak to the seller in the same situation that they were in, and it was their idea, and Google decided you were up there, all these things kind of combine that a lot of the hard work is done before they even come to me. And then all I really need to do is not mess it up. And so, you know, when it comes to being efficient, you know, you got to find what works for you. Now, if you've got a big team and you've got a bunch of sales guys, then sure, you should be cold calling. You know, you should be texting as long as that's legal. There's some new things with that. Um, you know, you should be direct mail. You should be doing everything. You should be blasting because you've got a lot of payroll and you've got a lot of people that you need to keep busy. But if it's just me, if it's just you, then I don't want to talk to a hundred direct mail people who are just, why are you sending me this letter? Like, I want the people that was their idea. They're ready to sell. Let's get, let's get, let's get this going. We're either going to do it or we're not. So I'm not there to waste time. They're not there to waste time. And so I hope that answers your question because yeah. that's why I really like Google, whether it's ads or SEO. Um, it just makes a big difference in that piece there. Yeah. Because they're motivated. If yep. you're sending out the mail, they may not be motivated. I mean, maybe you hit them. Uh, maybe you're you like the lucky. person and they're like, well, wait a second. I liked what you put on the letter. You put a picture yeah. of the family or, you know, I liked what your letter was. I think I saw one recently and it was like, we love this home. And they put like their whole family portrait in there. I was like, I never seen that before, <laughs> but everybody's got a different style, but I understand what you're saying. And what you're saying is that you like that social media side, the Google side, because they're motivated. It's just a matter of capturing them and hoping they they fit in that um, that scope that you have to create when you do the 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 blasting or whatever they call it, the boosting, so people actually see it. Or maybe they're looking online; they'll see Jack's home offer on the right hand side, just like 
just like Amazon tracks everybody and what you're looking at, maybe yeah. you'll pop up on the right-hand side, but people are looking for you. So it's, it's really fascinating. So uh, marketing is a huge thing, and it's obviously a huge thing when it comes to uh, probate and getting probate leads and probate stuff. And I know this is something you wanted to talk about today too. And it, and it goes into sales and everything. It goes into everything that uh, you like about uh, deals and real estate. But talk to us about why what, what's dead is alive and why the Florida probate niche is the new hot market niche that everybody should be focusing on. What is it that you love about it? What are you focusing on? Talk to us about it. Well, I think, I mean, shameless plug for you here. I think having a great probate attorney makes that work, you know, Um, because those deals aren't aren't always lightning fast. You know, they've built up the reputation as as taking months and going to court and, you know, um, not really being easy to get done. So but the ones I've done with you have gone really fast, like almost too fast. The last one. (laughs) because i told the people it would be a month or two they had a tenant in the house and then i sent you the probate and like you had it done in like what like three days days. yeah it was crazy (laughs) and i was like ah remember when i said you could stay here two months yeah about that had to get out but what Uh, what but what do you see about it that is that seems to be more of that attractive niche like what is it that you're focused on with it that a lot of people may or may be missing the ball on. You just have to make it a good piece of your business. So like, it's kind of like cooking a big meal. Like for example, you're cooking Thanksgiving dinner, right? It's, it's not the, the microwave, you know, easy, fast dish. Like you may have to put it in the oven for a little while and, and just kind of forget it's there. Like some of them do take a little longer. Um, I don't know what I really like about it, I guess is, there's usually less emotional attachment um, to the house. Often the person that's selling the house has never lived in the house. And so, you know, they're faced with the fact that they're going to have to pay taxes on this thing. Do they need to get insurance? Does it have a mortgage payment? Crap, it's got a hole in the roof, whatever. So they see the, the property not as a burden, but as a as a borderline between a blessing and a burden. So a lot of times there is less emotional attachment. Um, they're vacant properties. They're already gone. So you can usually get good deals on them. So, I mean, that's the bottom line is you can get a good deal. Interesting because you would think that there would be more emotional attachment when it comes right. to the new properties, but in your perspective, you see it as less emotional attachment, more motivation. It's sitting around, maybe, you know, it's got to get, it's got to go, it's got to get uh, rid of. Um, and that's a great perspective, right? That's why it's, it could be uh, a great margin, right? Like you, have you found that they are great deals because the equity so high and the margins are good? I think they're less concerned with making every dime out of the sale, you know, because that's one area where you're really providing a service. So, you know, if you've got a good probate attorney like you, or I've worked with a couple others too, where you can say, Hey, I'm going to, I'll cover your probate. We'll get this done, you know, as, as part of the sale. So now they don't need to come out of pocket for those couple thousand dollars. Um, You can handle it for them at closing. So it's all just positioning yourself to become more and more valuable to, make it a service that you're providing and they kind of see it as a whole thing getting done. So it's like, it's not just selling the house. It's okay. I'm getting the probate done too. And the house is sold. So it's like, we're just going to get you a check at the end of the day. And so, I mean, the ones who they might be more attached if they choose to live there, but the ones who do choose to sell are less attached is what I really mean. Yeah, because they let it go or they've just been they they just don't want the burden. It is a burden to own a piece of crap property. Right. They just or they don't want to deal with it anymore, right? They keep they probably keep getting uh direct mail. They keep getting <laughs> right. uh, they don't want right. to keep getting mail anymore. Right. So they just finally want to get rid of it. Um and maybe they saw Trevor's uh Google ad and said, We would just want to get rid of this thing. You're like, score, I got it. So 
yeah, it, it, it's a definitely an interesting niche. I know you're all about it. I know, I know we've talked about it before, but Trevor, there, you're doing this all yourself, right? Uh, super dad, super investor. How are you doing this with just the, the kids around, right? I, there's so many, mm-hmm. there's so many pro, uh, professionals out there that are in their nine to five that are listening to the show, that are listening to the podcast, that are thinking, I go to work every day. I'm tired of the nine to five. I got kids on the side. Uh, but then if I leave the nine to five, I got the kids and I got to deal with the kids and then mm-hmm. I got to make the money. Talk to us and tell everybody. Uh, how do you how do you manage that? How do you manage the parenting role and the investor role uh, on on the side or as, as your primary focus? I mean, there could be a lot of distractions with that. I mean, you could have the kids around, you're trying to lock up a deal, and then the seller's also on the phone and they're screaming mm-hmm. and screeching right on the Zoom calls, yeah. right? So, how do you do that? No staff. How are you able to? This is all parenting. So many, so many people want to know how, how do you handle it, um, and what are the what's the secret sauce to it? Yeah, so it's it's the secret is this super simple, but it's it's confidence that you're not going to miss anything that you really need, and that if you do miss a deal, it's okay. So if so, long st- I got I got my kids four days a w- three nights a week, four days a week, whatever you want to say. A lot of times. I will straight up just turn my phone off and I'll just be with my kids. My, my son's three, my daughter's five. They're just chatty. They want to talk. They want all my attention. They want me to do stuff with them. The moment I start trying to text and like coordinate a closing and I start feeling like a little anxiety, a little anxiousness, and then they interrupt me and I'm like, Hey, don't interrupt me. I try to avoid that. I try to focus on what I'm doing. If I got my kids, I got my kids. Okay. If, if they get a little busy watching TV, then sure. Hey guys, I'm going to go make a call. I'm going to hop on. But there really is just this faith that, you know what? I'm with my kids today. If they're, if they leave a mess, if the seller leaves a message, I'll call them back later. If I miss that deal, I miss that deal. I don't need every single deal. And that's a blessing to kind of be in that position, but it really comes down to thinking about like, why are you doing this business? Like, why are you doing real estate instead of uh, anything else you could be doing? And the reason I do real estate is because I can make a large chunk of money in a short period of time. Most people and myself included, like I'm not exempt from all this, but you can get really stressed out. You know, when is the next deal going to come? I don't want to miss the next deal. But if you really have faith in the system and you trust the process and, and you trust what you've built, then more deals are coming. And if you turn your phone off for five hours to go on a long bike ride with your kids and take them to the park, I have found that every single time I've done that, like it's amazing. I'll come back and there'll be a seller on my voicemail and I'll just call them back in the morning when I take them to preschool. Like, and so that's the biggest thing is just realizing why I do it and having faith that I don't need every single deal. So worst case scenario, if I miss a deal, I'd rather miss a deal than be stressed out and telling my kids, no, 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 you can't talk to daddy and fight in and all that kind of stuff. And so I learned to just turn the phone off and I'm happy making a little less as long as my life goes better because I know this is just a season. Like this is just a season of life. They're not gonna be toddlers forever. And so it's, it's making the choices. I don't really believe in multitasking that much. If I've got one kid with me, like my daughter's really easy. If she's with me, cool. We're tag team and we're calling the seller. My boy's crazy. So, uh, you know, I'm probably not going to be doing any calls when I have both of them. I gotcha. Yeah. Cause it could be a lot of work. I mean, you're doing a lot of stuff all, all at once and you don't, you don't want to miss out on the time with the kids, which is also incredible to hear that as a dad, right? You want to be there for them. And if you miss the deal, because people would cringe at that too. It's like a seller's calling, like, you know, I don't want to miss out on that either. Cause yeah. that could be, that could be $50,000 right there yeah. on an assignment fee or yep. 20,000 doesn't matter, but yeah, you're sacrificing that, that energy and, uh, thing that comes through because you're, you're spending time with your kids, but you're balancing everything, right? Like you're, you're, you seem like you're good at balancing, uh, those moments. So it's, it's just a different world because 
people have kids and they want to jump into this world and they don't know what it's like. Um, and then you, you've been doing it for 20 years. So, I mean, you know, you, or you've been doing it a long time. Yeah. So you've been, you see yeah. what's going on. So Trevor on my show, I have signature questions. I, you can take them as rapid fire. You can take them as however you like, but I always ask these questions on every show. So, um, the first one I have is what is one of the most important tips to lock up your deal in a hot market? Call them back super fast. Call them back immediately. So like if I get a lead, I, I, I know I just got done saying that sometimes I can't, but when I can, that's what, that's what I do. So when I can and I get the text, I instantly hit call and I call that lead back as soon as I can. So in a hot market, you want to lock it up quickly. That's a great tip to call fast. I'll give you one more really good tip. When you do call that seller, stay on the phone with them for a long time, like 30 minutes. Set yourself a goal to talk to the seller for 30 minutes because if you're in a hurry and you're just hitting your points, how many bedrooms does it have? How much are you asking for the house? You're not getting to the deep rooted emotional reason that they need to sell their house. You're not giving yourself enough space. You're not giving them permission to unload their burdens on you. So relax and just talk to them like a person. You can have your property information sheet. They're going to cover everything. Just say, tell me a little bit about the house. You don't have to ask every little question. And when did you replace the roof? And when did you don't be so robotic? Spend about 30 minutes if you can. It doesn't always work. Sometimes they got to go. They're not in the mood, whatever. But that's a huge tip to locking up deals. Really spend time with them. Let them go wherever they want to go with the conversation. You can work in your questions. Oh, okay, yeah. So, you know, did you update the house or whatever? You can ask that kind of stuff as you go. Oh, really? When did you buy it? But find out more um, emotional stuff and, and be willing to actually just kind of be like a friend on the phone. I remember when right when you said that, the 30-minute conversation, yeah. that was something we talked about on the phone. I remember there was a deal you were trying to lock up and you're like, yep, just got off the phone. It was about 30 minutes. And I'm like, why, why did you why did you time it? Like, what was that? And you're like, I don't know. It's that the Trevor charm, the, the, th the 30 minute conversation. And That's that your words, not mine. <laughs> hey, well, I'll, I'll say in, in that, in that call, in yeah. the call, you were just like, that's what happened. That's, yeah. that's how it went down. The 30 minute conversation was what locked it up. And, yeah. and that's unique, right? Cause a lot of people are like, I don't really have time for this. I'm not doing this deal or yeah. you don't want to agree to my price. We're done or all of that. But like you keep the bond. And so that's a great tip for people out there. Now, yeah. uh, other tip for people out there is how do you keep building trust with a seller? Right? So not just from the beginning, not mm -hmm. in the middle, but throughout the whole thing in consistent ways. How are you constantly building that communication? Maybe it is the 30 minute call. Maybe it's just constantly calling them back. And when they call you, talk to them, maybe it's all the communication. You seem big on that, but what mm -hmm. is the answer? So I, I really think that first call, um, you know, how they say like first impression, you can't, you don't have a second chance to make a first impression. Like, so that first call really building in that, that rapport, that trust, um, and, and balancing it with, with your own experience. So like when you're new, you're going to be trying to talk about yourself and you're going to be worried about what they're thinking about you. But the more experience you get, the more you realize that you really can just listen and you can sprinkle in you know, little things to let them know that you know what you're doing. And so the conversation, it just becomes, I, I don't want to say natural because it's kind of a cop-out answer, but I'm pretty relaxed with following up. Like we can text each other, we can call each other. It's coming right to my cell phone. You know, if it's past a certain time, I turn it off anyways. So um, the best thing I can say is it's, it, it's, it's casual, but professional. And it's almost just like me and you. It's like, hey, yeah, um, did you talk to your husband yet? Uh, did you still want to meet on Saturday? I'm running a little late. Can, can we do two o'clock instead of one? Um, 
when do you want to close? Like just whatever you need to talk about, don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call them. Uh, they're people. So just be a person. I don't know. It's kind of a silly answer. No, it's natural, organic conversation, right? So natural, yeah. having that casual conversation is what makes the difference. A lot of people, I mean, this is why you have a certain role, right? This is why you have partnerships. Some people fit the role of the acquisitions, right? Which is why yeah. having that sales team is important. And then the others are at the end. So if you have that role of being able to talk to them, that's how you're building that trust, having that casual call them back conversation. So no, it's a great answer. Yeah. I mean, if, if the simple things are the things that sell, the simple yeah. things, people make overcomplicated, they overanalyze the situation. Um, so no, great answer. But one of the big questions I get on my show, totally different answers every time, right? Mm -hmm. Appraisal, it could be title, it could be the lender just taking forever. Um, it can be uh, the sellers are dragging their feet. It can be the tenants aren't lending them in the house. Everybody's got a different answer. But in your world, in the Trevor world, Mm -hmm. What do you find is one of the biggest deal killers that you come across? The biggest deal killer I come across is their asking price being too high. What do you do? <laughs> Kill the deal. <laughs> <laughs> Deal's over. That's it. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I'll talk to them and I'll let the, I'll let them know, hey, listen, that's not the ballpark I'm in. I'm in a different ballpark. You know, if, if you want me to come out, um, I'm happy to come out and give you a real price, but I just want to let you know before I come, I don't want to waste your time. I can't pay X for it. You know, I'm probably going to be somewhere down between Y and Z or whatever. Um, should I still come look? And so I'll put the ball back in their court. I won't be able to pay that. I'll probably be somewhere here. Should I come look? And I would say that's a good thing to kind of, turn the tables back on them and let them decide if, if I want to come or not, if they want me to come. That's it. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, if it, it doesn't happen, then it kills the deal and then it's over. Right. Yeah, it, it's if, if, you, if, if you notice what I'm saying too, it's like, I will spend the 30 minutes with them on the phone because I'm at home. I'm not wasting gas. I'm not stuck in traffic. I hate traffic. I'm not. So I'll, I'll put the time in on the phone looking up the property, really nailing down what the value is on the house. So I'll spend all the time, you know, on the lead, on talking to the seller, on deciding if it's a good deal. And then I'm not going to go waste my time if I don't think it's going to be a good deal to where I'm going to drive there. So I put the time in on the phone, on the computer, and then I'm really only going to the ones where they really want me to come. And I think it's, I don't need to get every deal I go see. Um, so there's no pressure like that, but it's, it's really just being efficient, efficient and not wasting time in traffic. I just hate sitting in traffic. Probably. Yeah. yeah no, everybody hates traffic. Yeah. Uh, but no, Trevor, all these answers are great. And I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about all the things I learned from you about these little tips and that you don't have to have, you don't have to have every deal. Not everything is, uh, something you need to take on, you, you know, you're cherry picking. It's just a fascinating concept because a lot of people don't do that. They take uh, on everything, right? So a lot of lawyers are like that with door law, anything that walks in the door, they take, I don't yep. follow that practice. Right. So it's, it's fascinating seeing you even talk about that on a big scale, on a real estate scale for mm -hmm. how you keep it going and you, you don't have to take everything on and you find the right deals and things will come. That's the, the moral of the story. I think for you is that it will come. All, all of these things will come. You just got to work at it, but you don't have to take it all in all at once. So yeah, take care of yourself so you can take care of others. There you go. Big tip. Yeah. Trevor, thanks so much for being on the show. Give everybody your, your social links. Uh, where can they find you and who are you looking for to reach out to you? What is that? What is that ideal person that you're looking for to reach out to you? either to build great partnerships, uh, build new, new partnerships. Who is that? Um, so the best way to really get me is to go to my website, uh, jackshomeoffer.com. Um, there's like a contact message, send it there. Um, I really don't check Facebook that much. I honestly just got on to, to post this tonight. <laughs> um, it's, it's been a while. Um, so, you know, hit me up on there. I'm always down to work to talk to people, to partner with people. Um, 
private lenders, other people getting started. If you need help kind of locking up a deal, um, you know, if on the acquisition side, I don't know if I can be of use, then hit me up, but I'm good. Right. No, that's, that's great. Where people I don't have like it. a big thing to promote. Like, you know, it just says, yeah, I just but, wanted to do the show and share oh, and give for sure. And then make sure you share this yeah. everywhere too. Everybody can, everybody can see it just in case they want to connect with you. Um, and actually we do have a question, uh, from D Dockery. Um, I actually have it on the bottom. I don't know if I can read it right here. What are you focusing on now? Buy, hold, flipping, wholesaling. D, thanks so much for asking the question on the Al Nicoletti show. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, D, thanks for asking. Um, what I'm focusing on now is just, just buying everything. So the idea is, is just to buy it, just to close it. And then sometimes I'm doing like a, like a wholesale kind of thing, a wholesale or, or doing a full retail. Um, but I'm trying to close on everything. And I have a reason for that. Like I am jealous of wholesalers. I love wholesaling. I think it's amazing. Um, there's a little personality niche in me. You might've picked up on it, but it's like, I don't like the stress of, I told this seller I'm going to close on the house and now I've got to scramble and find a buyer. And now I've got to arrange a bunch of showings. It creates too much chaos in my life. I need things simple. So I've, I've figured out kind of the private lending side and it's just less stress for me to go ahead and buy it. And then I'll figure out what to do with it. Um, and it helps, helps you maximize the profit on the deal instead of becoming a motivated seller yourself. And that's why you can miss a couple deals every now and then because you're not scrounging up, um, just taking every little thing that comes, you can take down the, take down the asset. You can maximize the profit on the deal and you can start making more profit on less deals. And so that's kind of my MO right now. More profit on less deals. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Hey, if that works, it works. Yeah. So, Hey, Thanks for answering that question. Um, I've been putting the questions up on the show, but this was the first time we were actually able to put the questions up there. So that was fantastic. Yeah, I'm seeing the little chat here. There's all kinds of cool comments. Oh, good, that. good. I'll, I'll look at them after. I can't, I can't even see any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, but. Vaughn, Nicholas, Guillermo, Robert, even my mom was on there. That's awesome. Hey, great. Hey, there we go, mom. <laughs> Well, hey, Trevor, thanks so much, man, for being here. Um, you know, you're you're a delight to have on the show. You're full of knowledge. You're you're the super dad. You're the super investor. And um, I, you always are dropping great quotes. I have great quote cards that are, are going to be made from all the things that you said. And uh, uh, thanks for being on. I'll make sure you'll get this whole episode when it comes out. But uh, before we end, any final words, final shots? Uh, just thanks for doing what you do, Al. I mean, it's really awesome to see... Uh, you grow and join the Jacksonville community and be such a great resource for the uh, investors here. Um, so I think you're doing a great thing and just keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, doing what I'm doing and trying to help everybody get out there and, and share their experience and share their, their story. Um, I don't yeah. think that happens enough. So, and, um, Hey mom, there you go. We'll wave to her, but I, you know, I think, I think getting your, your story out there and sharing your whole thing is, is important. And, um, I, I'm, I loved it. I loved every minute of, uh, you, you telling us your story. So Trevor, thanks again so much for being on the show and, uh, we will see you soon. I'll see you soon at the, are you going to be at the Yellowbird event? Uh, probably I just saw it. I need to look at the details, but yeah, okay, yeah. make sure you're at the Yellowbird event, but, uh, I'll be there and, and I will see you there, Trevor. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks. everybody. All right. All right, we're going to wrap this up. All right, everybody, if you want more content like this, make sure you check out the Al Nicoletti Facebook page, the Al Nicoletti YouTube channel. You can find episodes just like this on iTunes and Spotify. I have great guests on the Al Nicoletti show. They roll out weekly. And this episode, I don't know when it will be out, but it's live right now. So uh, make sure you check out the Al Nicoletti show, which is every Wednesday at 8 p.m. And I will see you next time on the Al Nicoletti show. Take care.